Welcome to the Brick Mortar Cloud Podcast, where we share about scaling stories in F&B and retail. This podcast is brought to you by Staff Any and produced by Nick Chan. I'm Jensen, one of the co-founders of Staff Any, and today I have Sufi to join us on this show. Sufi, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Awesome. Sufi, can you share a little bit more about um, you know, your story and um, you know, how do you come into the F&B scene? All right. So I think mainly, I, w- I would say it. Everything started 2013, where um, I was actually working with the founders of the Black Hole Group. So mainly Mustafa and Kelvin. Oh, yeah. uh, they also landed themselves in, in uh, FMB without really planning for it. They actually started a hostel. Right. And then I think the space below, uh, they had to do something about it. And then they started a cafe there. And I happened to be there. And I kind of helped them uh, with the management of uh, the, the first cafe. Right. And I think that was where I was really uh, not intri- not really just intrigued, but but captivated by the way that they were, they taught themselves uh, how to do everything. Right. Yeah. So long way back, what's that first cafe that started? It was called Working Titles. And yeah. now we have multiple outlets of that, right? Uh, right now we've got uh, two different working titles. Uh, one at Riverside. Uh, Kalam Riverside, another one at LaSalle. Awesome. And we just opened also a couple of months ago. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Actually, I like to do work in the LaSalle one. It's a very nice environment to, to do work. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, have I a mean, coffee and co-work. Yeah, you get a lot of students there. And <laughs> yeah, then, that's right, that's right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a nice vibe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, continue on to the story as well. I think that, that was where I started. And uh, I think in between, actually, I was I was there for maybe about a year and a half. And then I went overseas to study. Mm-hmm. So while I was abroad, I've always maintained contact with the two founders. Uh, where, where do you go uh, abroad? Uh, which I was I was in UK actually. Okay. Yeah, I was in UK. I did uh, I did law at first. Whoa! Then, <laughs> then I I realized like, shit, man, I'm I'm lying to myself if I finished it. Yeah, awesome. So it, it wasn't awesome. it wasn't what expectation was. So I kind of uh, switched to sociology instead. I see. Yeah, but I. Something in the back of my head knew that if if I were to come back to Singapore at any point of time, if the two founders were still running FMB, I would love to join them. Uh. That's super yeah. awesome. How did the name uh, Black Hole uh, Group come about? It's actually really funny. Uh, the, the first cafe that they had called Working Title, uh, they had a courtyard at the back. And uh, I think it came to a point where the people who were working there really enjoyed working there. So even if someone wasn't on shift, they will be hanging out there. And chilling. Yeah, and chilling. And, awesome. and waiting for each other to finish. So we always called it a place that sucks you in. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, and then from there, yeah, it became a black hole, black hole group. La. So right. place that sucks you in, it started from there. Right, right. Yeah. And also black hole group, group um, as a group has multiple brands. I think at least uh, five, six brands today, right? And yeah. I think the, the more popular one that I recently also visited is uh, Tipo Plasta, right? So, yeah. Um, share more about the brands that you guys carry and you know what's the, the vision of the group yeah so mainly I think for me while being being abroad uh, I've always I've never been culinary trained but I've always been uh, deep diving into food la. and and I always cooked for my housemates and I pasta so was a, was a obsession for me and then I think over the years there was a light bulb moment for me la, where where I felt that you know a concept like tipo pasta bar uh started like playing in my head and i was actually really excited about it came back told told the my two partners and told them like about this whole idea and and some somehow everything came into place when i returned back to singapore so we didn't start off as a group i would say in 2018 the group was still in its formation years right. yeah i i came in as a as a partner to run tipo pasta bar uh but I think everything kind of came together and accelerated our growth during COVID itself. Yeah, that was where we realized the importance of uh, really an overarching view on on uh, how we were running operations, even and and this the setting of systems, structures, right. processes that is needed within uh, it, and how to see it as a proper company instead right. of different right. individual brands. La. Right, right. So uh, Tipo Pasta Bar was quite viral for a period of time at the start when you all first started. Yeah. What was the direction and vision for that concept? Uh, why did it become so popular? Right. So sometimes, you know, when I cannot explain, like when I had that light bulb moment, I knew that there was a gap somewhere within the market. Mm-hmm. 
um, you see, I think mainly is what we did with pasta. So if you were to look at the way in which us Asians eat, we are actually very used to this whole build your own concept. If you are to eat your cai peng, nasi your padang, nasi padang, your yeah. yong tau fu, your roja. Pick your own mix and yeah. mesh. Yeah. So my idea was like, what if I took pasta as a product, right. deconstructed it, uh, put in different flavors into the pasta, do very odd shapes to it, mm. and let people have their fun in, in putting it all back together. I felt that that would be a concept that would be well enjoyed by uh, Asian. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think you're right so far. I mean, like everybody's really enjoying ourselves and it's one of my favorite uh, pasta restaurants in, yeah. in the entire Singapore. And I'm so happy that you guys scaled. Uh, but apart from that, you guys also have multiple brands. Of course, you mentioned Working Title as the first one and then also Tipo Pasta Bar. Uh, share more about like, so what's next with the group? Like what's the vision of the group? Uh, are you all going for more wow concepts or like yeah. where, where are you guys going for as a group? I think for us, uh, we've seen ourselves not just as FMB, but We'd like to see ourselves as a um, kind of lifestyle movement. Mm -hmm. We set ourselves that and, and with that, uh, we're not limited to just working on FMB in that sense. Of course, for now, we're, we're working on F, uh, just FMB concepts. Uh, for us, it's all about really driving innovation, art artisanality and creativity. And um, I think that's what's fun about what we do right. in that uh i see ourselves as being immortal having this kind of business model in right, that sense right, because right, right. uh you could you could kill a face learn from the lessons of you know whatever challenges right. that you've gone through right. and then uh give birth to a new face right. uh with being even bit uh better at every single aspect of it right. yeah so right, right. i think that's the fun part about how we view things and and for me i think uh, that is where I, over the last year and a half, I've transitioned more into a, a chief product uh, officer kind of role where I start kind of building the structures around um, culinary innovation, not just culinary right. innovation, but also the creative side of um, branding, marketing uh, and advertising as well. Right. So yeah. there's a three of you as the main, uh, you know, uh, partners that are running it. How do you split the, the you know, the focus area for the three of the, the, mm -hmm. the partners? Yeah. So I would say like at different point of times, there are, there's different needs that's needed. So we, we've always maintained that we need to be fluid even within our own job roles. So I think at COVID period, uh, there was a need for us to really all gel together. So we established... Uh, one that is good with the numbers and everything was the CFO. <laughs> I took on the operations uh, CEO at that point of time and the other partner was the CEO, the outward facing one. Yeah. So he was the one that really kind of saw yeah. the opportunities it's, uh, out there. Mustafa, right? Mustafa, the, that's the, Mustafa uh, yeah. facing the company. Yeah. Yeah. And then for myself, I think it was important to really build the structures around operations. Right. So at that point of time, we didn't really have like structures where we had like operations manager and then uh overseeing multiple outlets that kind of stuff so it was more uh building that at that point of time and as we built those kind of structures that was where we realized like right. all right now we've given ourselves leeway to look at other uh, facades of the business right. and and uh to keep ourselves fluid and and not just to always remember that whatever role that we're doing it's more to build a structure and and to ensure that you can put in systems and processes within it so that it can run like clockwork. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, are you still having fun running the show? Fun is... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, moving moving to uh, um, challenges and triumphs. So uh, I believe in this journey, uh, you guys uh, went in the COVID pandemic period and then you had some successes scaling at that period of time. And now yeah. with multiple outlets, I think you mentioned about 14, 15 outlets at least, right? Yeah. So um, maybe you can share one story on like, you know, one initiative or something you've done that was a, was a success uh, that you, you you can share with the listeners that are in the FNP space? Chal I would say a challenge and also a success in a sense is, is, is pandemic. La. I, I would say with any other business owner, the pandemic was really not an easy uh, period to go through. And for us, I think at the point of time, we had about seven different shops. Right. Uh, and if y'all could remember, I think the announcements were made three days before lockdown and three yeah. days after. You know, Very it was fast, super. Yeah. It was super tight. You were needed to really be quick about decision making, and I think for me, one of the wins at that point of time was really being able to be to have a bit of foresight in understanding. Okay, 
this COVID thing might be a real thing. Let's not be late in terms of jumping on the right platforms. So uh, there were platform like everyone was trying to get on board Grab, Order, right. uh, all the these different delivery platforms. I think we were we had a bit of foresight. We were in it a bit earlier. So by the time it came to really crunch time, uh, we already had all this set up. All systems go. Yeah, and and for us, we had to kind of uh, out of the seven shops, close temporarily close four. Open up three, combine all the menus, and did like an alawat delivery. Right. And I think at at that point of time, even to to uh, how, how do you make a decision actually? Like uh, when how did you all decide that hey we should close this four and we should focus on three and we should focus on combining the menu? How, what, what was the aha moment, the inspiration uh, for that? Because we realized like if you were to run as single entities at mm-hmm. that point of time, you will drown against everyone else. Right. Everyone wanted to hop on the same platform mm-hmm. to keep it. It's for survival at the end of the day. And how do you uh, join forces uh, within internally and present yourself as uh, a group that, that is uh, working collaboratively? And also at that point of time, even that wasn't enough, I would say. We even had to give like really ridiculous discount mechanisms to really um, get the attention from the public. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it really wasn't about... It, it was really about surviving. It was really about keep, keeping the cash flow and to keep all the stuff within uh, the group. Right. So, uh, COVID was transformational in that sense, right? So, what of the what kind of learnings you know that you had in COVID brought forward to today? Like it's seen in today's execution compared yeah. to pre-COVID, right? Like what has sustained and continued uh, today? I would say the importance of uh, I mean COVID. Uh, would have accelerated digitalization on 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 many in many angles. I think there was before COVID, we were running the 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 establishments individually, so it might mean that uh, people would be running with a different POS system, uh, working data running with a different one, and that was all based on you know as you grow, you kind of latch onto grants as well. Right. Yeah. Right. But then that that gave us like uh, that that uh, I mean, that wake up uh, right. that. Right. For us to really see ourselves seriously, we need to decide, okay, uh, what's the main uh, POS that we're going to use? So we ported over to that, made sure that all other platforms and systems were integratable with each other. Right. And then from there, it gives us a good viewpoint in terms of our data. Right. And from there, it helps us with how we move forward. Uh. So yeah. which is this a POS company that you guys in the end choose to consolidate your efforts on? So, I mean, this was like a, we always make a joke out of it. Like, it's like a, you date so many girls really at the end of the day you go <laughs> back to your first girlfriend so the first one that you had uh, <laughs> the first one was Revel you uh, want to give a shout out Revel so yeah. you guys will make a Revel and use it yeah. as the main uh, POS for yeah. all your outlets Revel yeah. is a really good product yeah because at the end of the day uh, I mean we 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 also try our best to to support um, local tech companies mm-hmm. as well uh, but I think very important is your main your main one and how then the other platforms that you use, uh, whether it be reservation reservation system, whether it be like uh, your accounting and all that, to be integratable to that main one. I and uh, yeah, so I think that was one of the biggest learning points for us. That's uh, awesome. And we had to go through a huge, I would say, change management uh, mm-hmm. at that point of time. And and that on its own is already a huge project. Uh. Right. Any new investments in uh, digitalization or scaling or productivity stuff uh, for your business? I mean, we are constantly looking as we grow our uh, different parts of the business. So I think what's nice was recently we've, we've always wanted to have our own uh, internal bakery and, and pastry kind of uh, kitchen. And, and I think recently it, it was also joined together with, uh, as we grew the, the Tipo brand itself, we started doing uh, pasta productions and centralizing it. <laughs> and with that, I think... It goes into logistics management as well. And and I think the search, uh, the importance of digitalization is always there. It's how you capture, you know, uh, when you're ready and also uh, how to keep on improving. Right. Because, I mean, that decision itself is a... Uh, it's very important because at the end of the day, it affects everyone else. How, how do you decide when to set your own central kitchen? Like, is there like a tipping point in the quantity or like, how do you decide that, okay, now I need to have my own to make my own bread, my own pasta and stuff. Is there a volume or like something that you all have internally that you're crossover and then you say, yes, we need it now. I would say we, we've never been a like super metrical kind of right. company. 
where like okay we know when we get here this is tipping point it was uh intuitive in that sense where uh, when we look for uh uh say when we set up a new outlet uh, the decision is whether are we going to make pastas there how how do we keep mm-hmm. um quality control for right. example so we, we would just have done it at the main outlet the biggest outlet but then over time you also start realizing like uh, you, you cannot be a supplier from there because you are uh, well, uh, a teacher that you have to serve customers at the yeah, spot right i can't yeah. be just making raw pasta for everybody yeah. right so, so it makes from sense. there i mean other opportunities came about where also during covid period there there were other businesses that uh was reaching out to us uh, for us to take over their spaces. Right. And I think we we usually go for that kind of model rather than uh, look for a bare space, do it from scratch. I think uh, it's helped us a lot in terms of like taking over spaces where the infrastructure is really set up and how do you latch onto that and make right. full use of it. So uh. in that case, you take places that maybe are already furnished and uh, you can save on maybe even some renovation costs and setup costs. Yeah. And in this case, uh, how would then the setup cost be differing? Um, because I do see that a lot of our brands, even though you mentioned it's uh, furnished from uh, existing infrastructure, yeah. it's damn good. La. Like the ambiance as well as the way yeah. you all redo the whole thing, yeah. it's different. It's like you don't feel that it's the same. Yeah. Is that like a significant cost advantage that, you know, based on brand new bare unit versus the refurbished one? How, how much money do you guys like save usually yeah. on, on that? Well, there is actually a huge significant a significant cost advantage. Right. I would say if if you are to set up your own from bare space, you're, you're looking at the infra- infrastructure as well. The electrical, the right. the, the water it's points and all right. that. And and easily that could go up to three hundred thousand. Exactly, right. right. Whatever size it is. Right. But with like a takeover, you can take over at I mean it depends. All what depends, period. all depends, yeah. yeah. It all depends. But can go less than a hundred. Less than a hundred. Yeah. And you just do mainly the exterior and the, the shape and form of the brand and stuff. Yeah. Or because of the But also one thing great is that we've uh we've developed a uh I mean we do subcommittees. Mm-hmm. So people have different roles. So for example, someone does that, that does branding and marketing, they would also look at um the whole design aspect. Yeah, so we we really um, put a bit of attention on customer experience, customer journey, uh, design aspect as well. We, I mean, some few few projects that I would say we're proud of that we didn't even use a designer or anything like that. We we designed everything. How do you ourselves. get the intuition actually? Like because to be very very honest, I think Black Hole Group when we go to like people pasta and stuff is very well designed. And and how did is it your side of your portfolio that you help with a lot of the the operations and uh, product uh, experience and all. Uh, how, yeah. how do you get inspired to have these standards and this quality? Wow. Uh, <laughs> a bit of a cheat code also. I, I have a brother who's an architect. Ah, I see, I see. <laughs> so consultation with our family. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Like, so for example, Tipo Pasta Bar, we, we had a very narrow shop at that point of time. Right. I was asking him like, hey, how can how can I let people know that this is a pasta shop. Right. And then he was telling me, hey, chicken rice, people hang the chicken rice. Why really? don't you hang, hang the pasta, pasta And it's beautiful, right? It yeah. works. And people people look at the pasta and they see the pasta yeah. and they feel the pasta and yeah. it creates the experience yeah. actually, right? So it, it, it comes from this kind of thing that are already out there like chicken right. rice, hanging chicken. Then suddenly right. it turns into like, why don't you hang your pasta? Good idea. Yeah. So I think that kind of input from a person who is really um, well versed in design Especially really aware. help uh, yeah. really help us with with this kind of design process. And yeah, I think we, we kind of brought that on to other projects that we did as well. That's awesome. Moving on to a uh, very important part of the show, talking about uh, KPIs, metrics, and benchmarks. Yeah. Uh, operating. 14, 15 shops right now, do you guys manage um, all your shops with like KPIs and goals and, and targets and stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, I would say, I would touch on culture first. Yeah. Like, when, we've, when we started, we've never been a metrical kind of uh, company. Uh, I think what was important to us was how can we push the boundaries of creativity uh, and innovation. But also as we move along, we also realize like, you know, creativity can just, can't just run without certain structures to it. So we, we have certain rule of thumbs, very loose, I would say loosely set, but also tightly followed through. Loosely set or tightly followed through, I like that. I'm going to take that quote and I'm using myself. <laughs> loosely set and tightly followed through. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a fine balance. La. So, for example, um, of course, we, we set the, the important ones are, of course, your cost of goods 
and also your cost of labor that would make up your your main your main right. cost and and with that we do set certain targets to it. Uh, for example, for COGS, what kind of uh, ratios or percentage do you aim as percentage of a revenue? Right. So for us, not coming, I think that's the great thing. Not having any FMB background, mm-hmm. you don't have any reference point, and and for you, you can you can set something and make it a reality. So for us, we we tend to set it at about. Uh, 22%. Well, that's very, very good. And uh, yeah. the manage, you all manage to do that because a lot of times the past time that you make yourself is that yeah. right? Yeah. So a lot of- that's where artisanality mm. takes on um, its balance with like, you know, the, the cost of goods as well. Right. But right, of right. course, you then have to balance it with the cost of labor. Labor, because now more people are making the pasta, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that is a fine balance that we have to play around with. So uh, for places with low COG, uh, we allow for the cost higher. of labor to be a bit higher. More service, yeah. Yeah. But it's never been a flat all throughout yeah. uh, it's it's more of a rule of thumb uh, your your target for your COG will be at about say 22% right. your cost of labor will be at say 28% got it got yeah. it yeah uh, and and we're quite firm on on this ones uh, <coughs> mainly because understanding the rising cost of like rents and all that right. you know so keeping a bit of leeway for for other other parts of um the the overheads right yeah. you guys have been expanding very quickly um do you guys ensure each shop is profitable first before you open or do you guys uh open when it's a path to profitable like you see it coming up already and i say okay it's time to 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 hit what the iron is hot like how's that uh, expansion concept for you guys mm. we've also been very fluid with our expansion concept as well um so in, in a way of course, say for example, we see Tipo Pasta Bar as a uh, as a brand that had uh, potential in, but uh, is our expansion strategy simply gonna be duplicating that same one? Uh, I think in a in a in a space like Singapore, it's not we we choose not to do, do that lah because mm-hmm. that would have been the easier route to it. So instead, we look at it as uh, an opportunity for us to diversify a working brand. So like. Tipo Pasta Bar, how, uh, we had the idea of doing Tipo Pizzeria instead, mm-hmm. having the same kind of concept, right. uh, putting it and kind of diversifying the, the kind of clientele that we have as well. Right. Because what we learned in COVID, every segment of the market was was affected and it was important for you to really diversify. Right. Yeah, so, so so what's in for 2024, 2025? Are you guys opening new brands, new concept? What's the direction for these two years? Uh, direction for 2024, I would say to slow down. <laughs> I think that the past few years have been uh, quite pivotal for us to really make all the big moves uh, and and that was mainly done uh, I mean growth was for survival uh. right. if you if you don't continue growing I think uh, you'd constantly be stuck in that 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 loop where where COVID really hit right. hit us hard uh, that was the need for for us to grow but I think looking at 2024 looking at the market trends uh, what's happening I think people are buying Right, uh, tightening their strings, yeah. yeah. Kind of, so, know, I think for us, we're, we're, we've got other opportunities up ahead of us, but we, we are also realizing like, right, let's slow down, let's tighten up on a lot of, uh, I mean, our current, because we, we've expanded rap- rapidly. Right. Uh, there are so many parts of the business that can be tightened up on. Uh, and this is where we look, look back at our systems, processes, how do we keep our efficiency levels, and then, but also not lose sight of what's up ahead. So awesome. I think for someone like myself that looks at um, group level innovation and, and um, all in group level innovation, all of this still has to move, move on. Uh, still need to dream. Still need to have those dreams there because when the opportunity comes, you'll be able to know where to plug and play. Right, uh. right, right. Yeah. So I'm going to move on to the quick fire session where we will talk about a few questions and then you try to answer in a short sentence as you can. Okay. So um, who is someone in the industry that you learn a lot from? Uh, I think sometimes we are really in our own bubbles. <laughs> uh, but also, I would say, lo and behold, group. I think they are someone that we look up to mainly because they have a similar kind of model. Yeah. Is there someone in the group you want to shout out to and hopefully you can invite to the show? Wow. Ting. Ah. Ting. <laughs> hopefully you can invite him for the show. Yeah, that would be, that'd be so awesome. Yeah. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you hope that you have received before you started up this uh, career in FNB? Uh, wow, advice. Stay foolish. 
Stay hungry or stay foolish? Both, right? Stay both, hungry, stay both. foolish. Stay hungry, stay <laughs> foolish. I think uh, that's the only way to go because if you have to know too much at the start, it will it will actually um, might even stop you from confine you, right? Yeah, Rather than might, might confine you. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. If you have some daughter that wants to join you in this journey in FNP, what's one advice you give him or her? Don't. Don't. <laughs> 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 nah, nah. I think. <laughs> Why oh, don't? <laughs> At the end of the, I mean, I'll say don't lie. I wanna. At, at the end of the day, uh, you really need to have it in you to 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 see this as something exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's really not for everyone. Uh, it it is not. I a lot of people see just the the glory part of it, but I think there's more hard work than even the glory lah. Right. And it as you grow, it becomes a responsibility. So for me, if they really have that interest, I would say. Uh, by all means, go and explore the, the whole industry. Right. And then... Live your life. Do what uh, you want. Yeah. But when you want to start something, yeah lah, you need that that, that light bulb moment. Ah. That's how to, you did to, for Tipo Pasta Bar. To tell you that you're confident enough. Like, there must be a reason why right. you're, you're confident enough to say I want to do something. Right. So if uh, one of the evenings I'm having a dinner with you and then, um, you know, I'm going to a, your restaurant that is a combined of everything. Right? Uh, and then we have uh, two mains, two appetizers. Uh, what would you recommend us to eat both of us you know uh, on a having having good like you know pro night wow. uh, in your restaurants any of your concepts yeah mix and mash also okay wow, for myself uh, actually you yeah. know how people pass about you can build your own and everything exactly. like, every single time I go there I eat the same thing <laughs> which one is it uh, this will be the dark carbonara like the crazy, we call it crazy carbonara uh, mainly with smoked duck and sous vide egg some some Somehow it really works. La. It works. And then uh, I would say pizza. At Tipo Pizzeria, we have this pizza called Medi Magas. It's a Mediterranean take on a pizza with harissa sauce and lamb and all that. Uh, I think it. Fireworks. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I'm going to yeah. have that pizza uh, myself. <laughs> so uh, if someone is interested in following your journey, how should they best follow you? Uh, I think, of course, social media, we've got uh, each of our. Uh, entities have got their own Instagram but also uh, and the whole group we've got black hole group are you willing to offer a one just to one coffee session or zoom session with an aspiring F&B entrepreneur yeah for sure I think (laughs) (laughs) I will always give the same advice uh, and I mean I'll be free to 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 kind of jump in and and help the community as much as possible how does your parents feel that you gave up a law degree or law uh, education right and to go into F&B it's an Asian question that I need an Asian Asian answer for (laughs) of course from the start (laughs) I mean I wouldn't say the support wasn't there it was always like why do you want to do this why do you want to do this but then you just have to stick to it and like no one else is going to believe in yourself except for yourself. Right. And once you really start believing and, and do it, right, then let, let the rest of it speak for itself. Uh. Right. But I, I, I've, I'm never vengeful or anything about it. I don't say like, uh, you see, you never give me opportunity. I, but like for me, it's more of like, yeah, I really stick through with what I wanted to do and what I felt that brought me through happiness. And with that, everything else follows. Lah. But at the same time, also never never be too complacent because you never know what's going to happen up. up That's ahead. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you, Sufi, for being part of our show. And if you are a listener that wants to stop studying law and go into f and and follow your passion, <laughs> Sufi has a one to one coffee session with you to mentor your journey as well. Thank you, Sufi, for Thank the show. So Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Awesome.